Okay, two, two key concepts. Uh, the first is pharmacokinetics, and the second is pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug. Okay, so when you take uh, a medication, what goes in your mouth is not necessarily what's going to end up in the brain or come out when you go to the bathroom or sweat. Okay, it's going to be subject to oftentimes really massive alterations through processes of metabolism. Uh, in psychiatry, there are two drugs that go in and come out the same way. Lithium uh, is an element, so it can't be metabolized. And then there's a drug called Neurontin, which is a, a anti-convulsant, uh, anti-seizure drug that goes in and comes out the same, but all other drugs are altered by processes of pharmacokinetics. Pharmacodynamics are what the drug does to the body at the level of the receptor. Okay, Does it block a receptor? Does it activate one? Is it an agonist, an antagonist, or, or what have you? We're, we're now start, starting to move into stuff that, that really matters in terms of clinical practice. Okay. That what we've talked about before is going to be important, but now we're getting to some real stuff. And it has to do, first off, we're going to talk about, uh, about pharmacokinetics. And the sort of the bottom line is that if you don't have adequate blood levels, then it's not going to work. And people metabolize and handle drugs in very different ways. Even within uh, you know, the, the range of normal functioning, normal liver and kidney functioning, there's still a lot of individual variability. Okay, keep in mind that uh, probably up to 30% of people, it never get, reaches adequate blood levels because they don't ever take the pill. <laughs> okay, but we're going to assume that they actually have taken the medication and see what happens on a uh, trip from the mouth up into the brain. Now, first let me mention that there are different uh, formulations, different ways to get medication into the bloodstream. Uh, the most common are oral medications, okay? Among oral medications, there are liquids, there are capsules and tablets, and then there are effervescent formulas. Now, in Europe and in England, uh, a lot of these drugs are effervescent, which are like Alka-Seltzers, which is really a good thing because that way you absolutely make sure that they are liquefied when they go down your throat. And that'll, uh, that matters. I'll talk, talk about that here in just a minute. The reason most drugs like, uh, like this are not effervescent in the United States has to do with marketing because they don't taste good. Okay. Uh, you can also, there are some injectable versions of some of the drugs, uh, especially some antipsychotic medications. There are transdermal patches. Uh, we all know about the nicotine patch. There's a transdermal patch for treating ADHD. Uh, one's going to come out soon for generalized anxiety disorder. There is sublingual, which is under the tongue. Okay. Now, the, the advantage going under the tongue is that it bypasses the GI system. It bypasses uh, the gut and the liver and goes right into circulation. And we'll see that there are some advantages with certain drugs uh, with that. And uh, so far there aren't any kind of topical you know, things like you know, rub on your skin. Uh, but you can get many of these drugs formulated as uh, rectal suppositories. Now, I think especially for people who have disorders and they also have uh, anal personality, uh, th that this is a, ra a preferred route of administration. You know, it's, it just really speaks to the individual client. No, I'm just teasing about that. I only had one person that, that needed this, uh, but if you work in a setting where you have ex very uh, medically ill people, sometimes this will work. I had a, a woman who had a severe end-stage leukemia and she became very depressed and she couldn't keep anything in her stomach, nothing, okay? And, and actually, uh, so the, the pharmacy uh, did this, in, in every large city they have what's called a compounding pharmacy that can, uh, you know, uh, formulate drugs in a particular package, like they can uh, make micro doses, for instance, and put them in pills, you know, so people have to start off with really low doses. Uh, they can make them into uh, suppositories and so forth. And, and she responded very well. Now, she died about 
six months later, but she was she was refusing treatment and she was depressed and and she responded very well. So just keep in mind there, there are different ways to get the stuff in, into your system. Um, but for the most part in the United States we're talking about uh, oral medications and most of these are capsules uh, or tablets. Now here's where we run into our first problem, potential problem, and that is when, when uh, a pill gets into the stomach it's got to be liquefied before it can be absorbed and the majority of absorption occurs in the small intestines. But there are a number of situations where it doesn't stay in the stomach long enough uh, to actually become liquefied and it gets flushed through the system. Now, I, I really wish I had that videotape of this, but a few years ago on PBS they had this, uh, they had this show. Uh, it may have been one of those like dirtiest jobs shows or something like that. Anyway, this guy had made a million bucks because he owned a company that had portable toilets. They used at sporting events and you know concerts and stuff like that. And so what he was, he was showing what they did, at how they cleaned them out. This was very, you have to use your imagination, okay? Especially right after lunch. But they would put, get a forklift and, and pick it up and then they flush it out. And he said, now, he said, now look at this. And they, they panned in and looked at all this stuff that was coming out and it was pretty graphic. Uh, but the, the point was that there were like a hundred uh, pills mixed in with everything else. And he said, every time you flush this out, you get a whole bunch of pills, you know, are coming out of people. <laughs> and gosh knows what they are. They could be over-the-counter medicines. It could be prescription drugs. It could be vi vitamins. Who knows? But, but the point is that uh, it's not uncommon that people will take medications, uh, tablets and capsules, that don't stay in the system long enough to be liquefied, and they get flushed out of the system. All right? Now, uh, let, let me give you uh, m most of my best case examples are ones where I made mistakes. And so this is a long time ago. I was working at Kaiser. This woman came to see me and she was uh, uh, probably in her mid-sixties and this was just a horrible, horrible uh, situation. Uh, she, her, her son-in-law and daughter got into drugs big time and they were in some kind of cult and, and her grandchild, they were using him in some kind of a ritual and they forced uh, uh, feces down his throat and he choked to death and died okay and that was the stressor and she came in and it, it wasn't just losing your grandchild but this, these horrible circumstances surrounding that it was just awful okay so anyway this woman was very severely depressed and so I've seen her weekly in psychotherapy and also she got put on antidepressant medications now uh, this was a number of years ago and at that time uh, I don't think Prozac had come out yet, so we were using tricyclic antidepressants, and uh, so she was getting her medications and uh, gradually increasing the dose, and, but she wasn't getting a lot better, maybe a little bit, but not very much, and uh, it's probably maybe six weeks into treatment, and already she was at top end, the so-called uh, top end dose for this particular tricyclic. And she wasn't getting any better, and so she's in my office, and she goes, oh, excuse me, and she gets up, and she runs out of my office, and she comes back, you know, five or ten minutes later, and she goes, God, I'm really sorry, I apologize, but uh, uh, I, I had this uh, acute uh, case of diarrhea, you know, and it just, it just comes on me, I mean, I, I mean I've got, when i got to go, i got to go. And so I asked her, I said, does that happen often for you? And she says, yeah, probably ten or twelve times a day. Oh, wow. oh that's interesting. So, guess what? She's been taking her medicine, uh, you know, faithfully on a regular basis. Uh, so, I worked at Kaiser. We sent her down to the lab and they did a, a blood test to see her uh, blood levels of this tricyclic and it was practically zero. So, what was happening is that she, it was just going right through her. It was going right through her and she was suffering terribly. Uh, and, and the thing is that a lot of people don't like to talk about uh, sex uh, or bathroom habits. Okay? <laughs> now, what you get not infrequently with anxiety and agitation is increased gastric motility. And you can see this in many contexts. You can see it in people who have severe anxiety disorders. You can see it in people who have a severe situational stress. You can see it in mania. You can see it in agitated depressions. Okay, so any time that we have somebody that we're evaluating, and and they they show agitation or anxiety as a prominent clinical feature, then we need to say, uh, I need to ask you, are 
uh, do you experience frequent diarrhea? And, and then they'll tell you. Okay? Now with this lady, what we did is the particular antidepressant that she was on actually uh, if you get the dose up, uh, appropriately, it'll cause constipation, which might be a good thing, actually, for this woman. So we pushed the dose up, and I remember the psychiatrist right across the hall, a friend of mine, actually he and I did this, this book together, uh, he, said, he said, hey, listen, I got a call from the lab, or excuse me, from the pharmacy, and they said, God, this, you're uh, uh, prescribing this woman almost a toxic dose of this, of this drug. And, but uh, we explained to them that, yeah, but her blood levels are terribly low. And eventually she got adequate blood levels and two things happened. One is her depression started to significantly improve and her diarrhea started to go away. And then guess what we did? Have to back off on the dose. Okay? And she was okay. All right, bulimia. Uh, I, th that's a no-brainer. You know, whether people are doing vomiting or they're using laxatives, Lots of people don't talk about bulimia. Okay, now if you look at, at the at the epidemiology on this, people that have bulimia, half of them also have major depression, and it, it's hard to know for sure. But the assumption is that many, many, many people who have both bulimia and depression come for treatment of the depression, but they never tell anybody about the eating disorder because they're embarrassed about that. But, once again, they're doing something that results in, the, in drugs not staying in their system long enough. And then finally, it's antidepressant-induced diarrhea. And we'll talk more about this here in a few more minutes, but uh, all of the antidepressants, basically all of them, except Welbutrin, have an effect on serotonin and can cause GI side effects. And sometimes it's diarrhea. Okay, and uh, again, I mean, just such a shame when somebody is, is suffering a lot uh, and, and they're really trying to be faithful, you're taking the medicine and spending the money for it, when it turns out to be something like this, when nobody asks about it. Okay, okay liver metabolism. Uh, rates of liver metabolism uh, matter a lot, and there are uh, almost all these drugs rely heavily on the liver. Uh, to metabolize it. Also some metabolizing occurs uh, in the bloodstream, some in the gut, but mainly it's the liver. And let me go back here a couple of slides. Once it's, uh, the drug has been liquefied and then, then it is, uh, before it goes into general circulation, it goes through a, a very small uh, portal system, that takes it directly to the liver uh, before it goes out into general circulation. And the liver is the great metabolizing organ. It's also the, uh, the guardian of the body in terms of guarding it from potential toxins. And, and so uh, what will happen is then uh, whatever drugs you're taking go in here and then they're going to, to a greater or lesser degree, they're going to be subject to what's called a first pass metabolism. They're going to be uh, acted on by, you know, uh, trillions of uh, enzymes. That are there, and the job of the liver is: I, if there's anything coming into my body that is not me, I'm going to change it. I'm going to alter it into a form that can uh, result in more rapid excretion. Get it out of here. The liver doesn't give a damn about whether you're hallucinating or having panic attacks or anything. It's, it's, it's just anything that comes in that's foreign substance is going to act on that. Okay. Now we'll talk in a few minutes about. Uh, how rates of metabolism are very different. But let me give you an example of something, okay? Now, I'm making these figures up, but let's say that somebody takes the drug uh, Zoloft, okay? So it gets liquefied, let's assume, goes into the liver, and let's say we have 100 trillion Zoloft molecules with one dose, okay? It goes in, it goes through the liver, it is, it is massively uh, affected by liver enzymes, and that 100 trillion molecules, on the other side, 2 trillion come out into circulation. Okay, so the, the point is, that, and, and the other has been, has been ch uh, chemically altered into a state that's going to be rapidly excreted. What matters is not so much what you swallow, but it's what gets in the bloodstream. It's the blood level of the medication that's going to matter. Now, uh, once again, uh, gabapentin or neurontin and lithium uh, are not metabolized by the liver, okay, but most of the other drugs are. Okay, so how rapid you metabolize, how aggressively you metabolize medicine is going to make a big difference. And let's say you have two people, same age, exact same weight, okay, same gender, same diagnosis, and one of them will take 
20 milligrams of Prozac and it treats the depression effectively and the other takes 20 milligrams and it doesn't work or, or squat. There are many reasons that could be the case, okay, but one reason is that that second person may have what's called a rapid metabolism and more aggressively metabolizes the drug and therefore gets inadequate blood levels. And we're going to see later, especially when we talk about mood disorders, that uh, getting aggressive about gradually bumping the dose up, if necessary, to high level, very high levels, it is a high yield approach because there are going to be a certain part of the population that are rapid metabolizers. Okay, uh, People that are slow metabolizers, if they are started with a normal starting dose, it's going to go through the liver and not be metabolized as much, which is going to result in initially much higher blood levels. And these people then are much more likely to get what? Hit by side effects a lot more strongly than a person who is metabolizing stuff really rapidly. Is this making sense? Okay. And really, I can't overemphasize this. A lot of times, this is what accounts for success or failure. It is just keeping in mind that that's a huge variable here, okay? Okay, so uh, we're looking at rapid metabolizers, low blood levels, and little response to normal starting doses, okay? And there's probably a standard distribution here, maybe 5% or, or less of people are, are here, 5% or less are here. There are ethnic differences as well. Uh, most of the people is going to be somewhere in between, but there are going to be some slow metabolizers. They take even relatively low doses, immediately get high blood levels, and they have lots of side effects or maybe even toxicity okay, from the drug. So what, what are the factors then that are going to influence the rate of liver metabolism? Okay, first off, uh, th this is, should be seen as not related to general metabolic activity. So, you know, we talk, usually talk about uh, levels of metabolism in terms of how rapidly you burn calories. I mean, some people can eat lots of food and they don't gain any weight. You know, some people eat normal amount and they put on a lot of weight. Uh, that, that's addressing the caloric uh, intake and the amount of metabolism that occurs uh, in the body in general. This is unrelated, okay? So you can have somebody who ha uh, has high metabolic rate in general, but slow liver met metabolic rate, okay? Now, secondly is age, and this, this uh, matters a lot. Uh, after a few months, after a uh, kid is a few months old, then liver metabolism rates begin to stabilize and are relatively, unless there's some kind of disease or something, relatively stable until around puberty. And in general, the rate of liver metabolism in kids, in pre-adolescent kids, is significantly higher than you get with adults. So for this reason then, and uh, those of you that are taking the two unit course, we're going to get into child treatment. Okay, We'll talk more about it later. But uh, kids oftentimes end up taking doses of these medications that are equal to what you give adults. So occasionally higher, actually. But, uh, and this is counterintuitive for a lot of parents. You get, uh, one a good example is uh, uh, treating OCD. Uh, you know, up to 50% of OCD starts uh, pre-adolescent. And uh, if, the, if they use medications, they uh, using SSRIs are typically used to treat OCD. Uh, this parent may come in and say, "For God's sakes, you know my kid's uh, eight years old and, and weighs you know 79 pounds. Has taken 40 milligrams of Prozac, and I got on the internet, and you know that that's whoa, that's a huge dose. And that's where you know it's going to be important to say uh, this. This is not a, a reflection of how sick your child is, psychiatrically ill." Uh, but it's very likely to be due to the fact that kids uh, are, are metabolizing the stuff really quickly. And sometimes it's a good idea to tell parents that to begin with, to say, uh, you know, when you're discussing medicine, that uh, we'll, we'll use the lowest dose possible to get a response, but uh, many kids require what look like pretty big uh, doses, and this, is, and this is why. Okay. Okay, uh, now... Uh, then around puberty, there, for, there's a period of maybe three or four months as the child is starting to enter puberty, then you, there's a relatively dramatic uh, decrease in rates of liver metabolism. 
and, and it's going to eventually hit kind of a, a level that will be with them throughout most of their adult life. Now the relevance of this is, is if some kid has been on a medicine for a while and, and chronic, so another good example of chronic treatment of BOCD. Let's say since they were eight they've been taking an SSRI and now they're 13 and they're starting to go into puberty. Uh, what's going to happen is they may be, start showing up having side effects where they hadn't had it before. Uh, especially uh, GI side effects, for instance, okay? And what's happening, right? The liver is, is slowing down. It's not pathology, but the rate of liver metabolism is slowing down. And now they're taking the same dose, but they're actually getting higher blood levels, and, and the consequence is they have more side effects. So is working with kids uh, who are already on medications and they're headed towards adolescence, it's fair to tell parents that we may need to do some dosage adjustment uh, during this next six months or so and uh, just you know keep talking to your kid and I, or I'll talk to them and make sure we don't have uh, the emergence of side effects. Okay. Now barring uh, diseases and substance abuse, liver metabolism rates are probably going to stay relatively stable th throughout adult life until about the age of 60. Uh, or 65 in the early 60s. And my definition of elderly it changes all the time, you know, as old, older I get. But <clears throat> supposedly, after the age of 60, uh, elders uh, begin to have a, a very significant decrease in liver metabolism rates. Okay, so uh, let's say you have somebody comes in and they have a major depression and they are 68 years old. Uh, the rule of thumb is the standard uh, starting dose for an antidepressant typically is going to be at least half of what you would use with, a, uh, with an adult, okay, or maybe even less than that. And the old adage is start low, and if you increase, then you do it slowly. Start low, go slow. Uh, you, um, really do not want to overwhelm uh, elders with side effects, and, uh, especially because many of them also are taking other medications, and you've got the complicating factors of drug interaction issues. Okay, uh, there are ethnic variations. Now, let me tell you something. Right now, uh, the data on this is, is not—it's it, it, soft. Okay, it, 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 there's not really enough information about ethnic variations in metabolic functioning to really inform treatment. But I think pretty soon there will be enough information, okay? We can't assume that every human being, uh, you know, uh, every ethnic or, or group is going to have exactly the same metabolism. So uh, that's something though I think in the very near future is going to be another factor that really needs to carefully be evaluated when you look at, uh, at dosing. Individual differences, there really is a standard distribution here. There's some people that from the get-go are rapid metabolizers. It's not due to disease. It's not pathological, but it's just who they are. And oftentimes, the people that are rapid metabolizers will tell you. Now, this is, this is certainly not perfect. It ain't rocket science. But if you ask people, when you take medicines, typically does the... the uh, recommended dose work for you? And some people will say, no, I almost always have to take more. You know, like I gotta take two of these allergy pills for it to work, or four aspirin, or something like that. Uh, the flip side of that is, no, actually, I, on almost all, uh, many medications, I can take like half the dose, you know, and, and it works for me. Now, now, that gives you a little sense about possible liver metabolism rates. What complicates this is that uh, I'm talking here about liver metabolism rates occurring in a global way, but actually there are there's a multitude of specific liver enzymes, and some of them may be more revved up than others. So, so asking that question about how do you respond to drugs in general is not a bad idea, uh, but, it, but it's not going to, you know, predict with great accuracy, you know, what the, what the situation is. But if you have somebody that says, you know, I, really, most drugs I take, I, I only t can take about half of them, and it works, but if I take the full dose, I get side effects. What are you going to do? Err on the side of caution and start with low doses. Now, let me kind of di digress here for just a minute. People who come for treatment do not come for trivial reasons. Every single person has, has been trying their best 
to deal with their depression or anxiety or whatever and it's just not working and for lots of people and of course I mean we all know this but it takes a lot of courage to kind of you know okay I'll, I'll go ahead and call my doctor or I'll, call, I'll go see a therapist a lot of people dial the number and they hang up because you know they bail out they get scared or they feel ashamed or what have you so I just assume that when people come into treatment that they're that that it's often not an easy decision to make okay now if somebody gets a prescription for a drug and they walk out and they start taking it and within a few days or sometimes within a few hours they have really bad side effects you know what happens often two things happen the first one is bad news by itself they the heck with this and they won't take it okay uh, but what's worse than that is they may be traumatized by this in, in a sense. They may become phobic about medication treatment. Let's say you have somebody who has some very uh, severe disorder like bipolar disorder uh, or, or some, other, but some other psychiatric disorder that may actually really respond to and require medication treatment, but if their first experience is that they, they have these horrible side effects, then, uh, then they may just say, forget it and they, they completely ruled that out as an option and we've lost them. And so I think a conservative thing to do uh, with any medication is to start with very low doses. Uh, number one, it's going to give you an idea about their rates of liver metabolism. If, they, if you start to see in, on low doses side effects, then it's like, okay, that's what we got to deal with here. The other thing is that uh, if they develop an allergic reaction, if you're on a lower dose, then it takes less time to get it washed out of your system and the person won't be plagued with the allergic reaction. But then once you've established what they can tolerate, then uh, get pretty aggressive. And, uh, and I'm going to come back to this specifically with these different disorders, uh, but one of the biggest problems in primary care is underdosing. And, and this is seen in study after study after study. And people continue to take medications even if they don't work sometimes. Or, you know, it knocks down their s symptoms by 20%, but then they still are not well. So there's, there's uh, in other words, there's very good reasons for being cautious and slow to start. There's also equally compelling reasons that once you kind of get on track is to go for it. And really, if you're gonna, if they need medication, do it right. Okay? Right. Liver disease. Uh, typically, uh, if you have uh, substance-induced liver disease, like you get with alcoholism, uh, like cirrhosis of the liver, but also other substances too, or people have had hepatitis uh, and other uh, more rare forms of liver disease, typically the liver loses its ability to make liver enzymes. <laughs> And so what that means is then when the drug goes through the liver the first time, a lot more is going to get out the other side because there just aren't enough enzymes to make that. So if you suspect or have a, a definitive history of liver uh, disease, and this can be picked up on liver function tests and that sort of thing, uh, then, then the rule of thumb is to start low and keep in mind you may not need to use high doses to get a uh, you know, good effect. And then there, the, there's the issue of the impact of substances. And I'm not talking about drug abuse here, but I'm just talking about drug, drug interactions. Okay, there, there are, are basically two things that can occur in the liver that can make a big difference. And, and this big, I need to sit down for a minute. This, the big difference here has to do with two things. One is side effect problems. The other is it, uh, it may render the drug ineffective. Okay, so let's take a look at, at these two things. Some uh, drugs that are used in psychiatry, not exclusively psychiatry, but that's what we're talking about, obviously, uh, induce liver enzymes. Okay, so enzyme induction means to increase the production of particular liver enzymes. Now what that means is if you have a, another drug uh, prescription drug, for instance, uh, that, that uh, is also going to be metabolized by a particular class of enzymes, because the, the level is up, it's going to be metabolized much more rapidly and you're going to get decreased blood levels. I'm going to give you a perfect example of this. St. John's wort 
induces big time the liver enzyme that controls the metabolism of birth control pills. And so there are women that are on birth control pills, they start taking St. John's wort, and guess what? They end up getting pregnant. Because without their knowing about it, uh, there's been enzyme in induction, and now the level of birth control in the bloodstream goes down, and they get pregnant. Okay. Now, on the other hand, uh, you have enzyme inhibition, and this is to shut down the production of enzymes. And, and so if you take another drug then, it goes through the liver, uh, more of it's going to escape and go out the other side. It takes usually several weeks of being on a drug for this to happen. It takes sometimes hours for this to happen. And in this class, we're not going to go into the specific enzymes and that kind of stuff, uh, although that information is available if you're interested in that. But uh, antidepressants oftentimes inhibit, inhibit liver enzymes and may carry significant drug interaction problems. When we get to the particular uh, categories like antidepressants, we'll talk, I'll talk real specifically about those that do and those that don't. Okay, and, that, and that, if, if, if you're not taking any other prescription drugs, it's not a problem, but it is a problem, and sometimes can be dangerous. Uh, you know, so antidepressants that are considered to be quite safe, that assumes that they're being taken alone. It doesn't mean they're going to be safe for people that are taking certain kinds of uh, other drugs. Common inducers, significant alcohol abuse, Alcohol increases depression, increases anxiety, and destroys sleep. Let's add on top of that that it can, it can jack up uh, liver enzymes. If you have somebody who's been stabilized on, on a medication and uh, they're starting to have what we'll call breakthrough symptoms, you have to say, okay, what's going on here? There could be a whole bunch of things, that, and we'll talk a lot about this in this class. Somebody's doing well, and they're, they're coming in and starting to have panic attacks again, or they're getting breakthrough depressive symptoms. So there's like a laundry list of things to look for to say, to answer the question of why. Uh, one of these may be, it's often unreported, increased alcohol consumption. Smoking can do this. Uh, these two anticonvulsants can, can do this. Uh, Tegretol is used in treating bipolar disorder, uh, and Tegretol and Dilantin both for treating epilepsy and St. John's wort. All right. And then common inhibitors, uh, and, and there's a few antidepressants that don't do this, but a lot of the antidepressants do this, and also Tagamet. And there, there are some people uh, in pharmacology that are saying, having Tagamet be an over-the-counter drug was a huge mistake. Tagamet by itself is effective and is very, uh, you know, safe to use, but it can cause inhibition of certain liver enzymes and cause drug interaction problems. So the, the, the FDA has been kind of you know, criticized for that. Okay. This is the last slide, and um, I want to just explain this, but for the purposes of this class, it's, it, I don't think it's necessary that you have to really know this, and it, it gets complicated, but just in case you're interested. Uh, here we have uh, Prozac, okay? Now, uh, P450, sometimes called cytochrome P450 enzymes, are, are, is, are families of, en of liver enzymes. Okay, and there's not just one enzyme, but there's a number of enzymes, and they very specifically target certain drugs that a person might take for whatever reason. And so, so the example here is that Prozac has a moderate effect on inhibiting this enzyme, 3A4. It, it, this is the biggest problem here, high likelihood of inhibiting 2D6. Now, if, if you're just taking Prozac, no problem, okay? But what if you happen to be taking a medication that also needs this enzyme here to regulate its metabolism, but it's been inhibited big time, you know, by Prozac, then the drug is going to do what? It's going to have different blood levels. So, uh, a lot of physicians do not know this. I don't have this memorized. Uh, the place to go are pharmacists. And they have databases. 
If you're looking at two different drugs, that's easy to do. You start looking at three drugs, all of a sudden it gets extremely complicated. And there, it's not unusual that older people are taking five or six prescription drugs. In which case, there's no, hardly any way to know for sure. Okay. But let me give you an example of something. Okay. Now this is something you'll run into clinically. And it's a big deal. 15 to 20 percent of the world population suffers from chronic pain. And of course many people suffer from acute pain. But uh, a lot of those uh, folks it goes on to chronic pain. And uh, this can be, you know, this can be due to arthritis, can be due to uh, uh, nerve damage from diabetes, uh, you know, hip fracture, uh, fibromyalgia, I mean, you name it, just any number of things that can cause sometimes very, very severe uh, chronic pain problems. Now, uh, these drugs that are probably relatively well known, and hydrocodone is Vicodin, okay, uh, has uh, Tylenol mixed in with it, okay. Uh, these three drugs are called pro drugs. Now, I would jot that one down, okay, pro drugs. A pro-drug is a drug that has to be metabolized into a drug that works. A pro-drug is a drug that has to be metabolized into a drug that works. So if you snort codeine, you, can't, you won't get a buzz. You have to swallow it, it has to go through the liver, and then all three of these are metabolized in, okay, in, into the effective analgesic, okay, into morphine. Now, here's, here's the problem. Let's say that you are taking uh, uh, Prozac, but it's not just Prozac. Uh, look here, uh, Paxil, also very high. Wellbutrin, moderately high. Look at this moderately high, Cymbalta. Okay, so these are drugs that are used quite a bit. Let's say somebody's taking Prozac and they are, because they're depressed, okay, and a lot of people who have chronic pain are depressed for many different reasons. And so then they go in and they're given uh, Vicodin or whatever. And because what's going to happen here is that Prozac is going to inhibit the production of this enzyme, there won't be enough of this enzyme to convert this stuff into morphine. So what's going to happen? No pain relief, right? So then this person's going to come in and they're going to say, Doctor, uh, I'm taking two Vicodin or I'm taking you know, two Tylenol 3s with codeine and it's not working. And guess what's going to happen probably 95% of the time? The doctor's going to start thinking, this is drug-seeking behavior. This person wants to get a buzz off of this. And look at this. It depends on the person's particular genetics. But these drugs can produce, look, 2 to 15 times lower morphine levels when they're taking one of these antidepressants. And, and you know what? My heart goes out to people with chronic pain because, uh, first off, it's hard to treat. It can destroy lives, but a lot of people end up uh, being judged to be drug seekers or chronic, uh, you know, or hypochondriacs or chronic complainers or it, but it, some kind of pejorative label, you know, gets attached to these people be, and, and they're hurting, okay? So this is not uncommon. What do you do? Well, you don't give these drugs. Uh, Selexa, for instance, has no drug interactions. Okay, and so that would address the issue. Now, how many primary care doctors, you know, really know this? Not very many. Uh, th these, these have, uh, down here at the bottom, have uh, very little effect on liver enzymes. Uh, Celexa, Lexapro, and Zoloft, these three right here, probably are the best. And it's one reason they're used a lot in people that are on multiple prescription medications. 